love our team. Happy Palm Sunday. What is Palm Sunday? Palm Sunday. Yes. But <laughs> awesome. Good. We got a theologian in the room. <laughs> so Palm Sunday is the beginning of Easter week, which is the pinnacle moment of the Christian faith. It marks when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. It's called Palm Sunday because they went out to meet him waving palm branches. And so they went out to meet him, and he rode into Jerusalem. They praised him as king, and then he ended up, they ended up killing him a few days later. And he ended up, that was Good Friday, and then on Easter Sunday, Jesus was physically, bodily resurrected from the dead on Easter Sunday. The Gospel of John puts it this way. It says, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival, which was the festival of Passover, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna means save, or please save, or save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Now, they were occupied by Rome at the time. Calling Jesus the king of Israel would have been treacherous, treasonous, because they were supposed to have no king but Caesar. Jesus rides in, they're waving palm branches, they're throwing their coats on the road, they're praising him as king, saying, save us. And I think on Palm Sunday, if you've been around church for a while, odds are you've probably missed out on a lot of the meaning of Palm Sunday. I think if we're honest, Palm Sunday is kind of the thing that we just breeze over on the way to Good Friday. I think a lot of us miss what Palm Sunday is about. And there is a significant revelation of Jesus that we have to understand from Palm Sunday. If we miss out on it, we're going to be missing a huge part of the Easter story. And I don't know if you, you know, I think sometimes we read the Bible and we kind of just read it and kind of feel like we know it. But this actually makes no sense. Jesus rides into Jerusalem. They're saying, save us. It's the king of Israel. A few days later, they kill him. Does that make any sense to you? It makes no sense. Jesus said some things and did some things that really upset the people and they turned on him. And we need to understand what those are. And so if you're here today and you're a believer, I hope and I pray that this gives you another revelation of Jesus. A significant one that you might not have seen before. And if you're here today and you're like, hey, I, I don't even know about church or about God. I'm kind of curious, but I don't really know where I'm at. This is a great week for you to be here as well. Because you are going to catch the beginning of what Jesus did on Easter week, which is the pinnacle of the Christian faith. What are we missing from Palm Sunday? The title of the message today is Why Palm Sunday Matters. Because it does matter. And in order to understand why Palm Sunday matters, we need to know a little bit about Jewish history. The Israelites had a long history of being conquered. Not a great thing to be known for. And they were conquered by the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Syrians, and now they were occupied by the Romans. And a couple hundred years previous, when they had been occupied by the Syrians, there was a guy by the name of Judas Maccabeus. There's a little picture on the screen behind me. This is a, a real-life photo. Just kidding. But Judas Maccabeus, his father, Mattathias, was the priest in the temple. And a Syrian officer walked into the temple. If you know anything about Jewish culture, pigs are unclean animals. Detestable. And he brought a pig into the temple, and he said to the chief priest, sacrifice this pig on the altar to a Greek god. And Mattathias said, I will not do this. Another priest jumped forward and said, hey, I'll do it. And in a moment of, of, of anger, Mattathias pulled out his sword, struck down the Jewish priest that was about to offer a debaucherous sacrifice, struck down the Syrian officer that tried to get him to do it, and him and his family fled out into the wilderness. And his son, Judas Maccabeus, ends up leading this revolt. Thousands of people from all across Israel flocked to it. They defeated the Syrian army, and they won their freedom for the first time in 500 years. And when Judas Maccabeus rode into Jerusalem, they ran out to meet him. They waved palm branches. They welcomed him as the leader of their nation. And so when Jesus comes in, a couple hundred years later, they're now occupied by the Romans. So Jesus rolls into town. They go out to greet him. They wave palm branches. They're shouting, save us. They're saying, this is the king of Israel. Do you see a connection? 
they were expecting that Jesus was going to ride in and save them from the Romans. And Jesus was also believed to be the Messiah or the Christ, which is something that was talked about in Jewish scriptures. Messiah or Christ, uh, I don't know if you know this, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a title. It means Messiah or it means anointed. And there's all sorts of Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. There's one I'll read you from Daniel. It says, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So the Jews are thinking when the Messiah comes, in the past, we've won our freedom and been conquered. Won our freedom and been conquered. But when the Messiah comes, we will never be conquered again. That's what they were believing that Jesus might be able to do for them. The problem with this is that Jesus came to establish his kingdom. He didn't come to establish their kingdom. Israel expected that Jesus was going to ride in, rally the people, turn them against the Romans, and win a military victory. And when Jesus did not do this, when he did not fulfill their mission, they turned on him. And they killed him. To summarize, Jesus isn't doing what I want. And they turned on him. I would argue that the Jewish people loved Israel more than they loved God. They missed out on God because they were so focused on their nation. And I want to ask you three questions today. The first one is, what is your Israel? Now, you're probably not Israeli. You're probably not Jewish. You might be. But Israel is that thing that you put above God. It's your number one allegiance. It could be the culture you came from. It could be the family that you came from. And again, you should be proud of the culture you came from. You should be proud of the family you came from. But the problem is when we put those things above God, it becomes a problem. Because we put them above God, and then we have to fit God in to our existing worldview. I would argue for a lot of Americans today, this is our political party. I don't know what kind of news sources you read. I read Fox News for conservative news, CNN for liberal news, BBC for global news, kind of everything in between. We live in a nation where we are living in two alternate realities. Fox News and CNN write about the same thing, but it's not the same. And so we're getting two alternate realities. And so whether you are conservative or liberal or whatever you are, I want to ask you a question. Are you, is that your number one worldview and you're trying to fit Jesus into that? Or is Jesus first in your life and you're trying to wrap everything else around that? The Greek word for heresy literally means to choose, as in to pick and choose. And so when you pick and choose the Bible verses that you like and you don't like, that align with your greater worldview, it is literally the definition of heresy. And so I would argue that when you do that, it's actually self-worship because you're putting yourself in the place of God. And I would argue that self-worship is the fastest growing religion in the world today. And so I want to encourage you to not lower Jesus to the level of your worldview, but to raise your worldview to the level of Jesus. Do not make an idol of your Israel. The Israelites expected that Jesus was going to ride in, overthrow the Romans. They shouted Hosanna, which means save us. But they weren't saying save us from our sins. They were saying save us from the Romans. Instead, Matthew tells us, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer but you are making it a den of robbers. This is all wrong. Jesus is supposed to ride in, rally them, defeat their external enemy. Instead, he goes straight into the temple and calls them out on their idolatry. Woo! That's not what they were expecting. Jesus should be addressing the sin of the Romans. Instead, Jesus comes in and addresses their sin. You and I all have in Israel that thing that we try and elevate above God and then fit him into, but you and I also all have a Rome. That external thing that we kind of try to blame everything on. That's our kind of external distraction. It keeps you distracted and it keeps you making excuses. I would be walking with God, but, I mean, my boss, he's just such a jerk. 
I wake up in the morning and I'm just stressed and I can't stand my job and my boss is mean and I just, I would spend time with Jesus in the morning, but I'm just so stressed about my job. If I only had another boss, I'd be able to worship God. Let me tell you, you get a new boss, that's not going to fix your problem. The problem is not out there, the problem is, for us, is in here. If my family wasn't so dysfunctional, I come from... (laughs) Hitting a little close to home for my wife, apparently. I'm just kidding. So, (laughs) I would be following Jesus better, but you know, my family was kind of like this and like that and like that. Therefore, I just, I'm not going to be able to really follow God wholeheartedly because it's just kind of how I grew up. And again, I'm not trying to downplay any of the things that have happened to you. Uh, That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is uh, the problem is always out there. It's out of your control. God doesn't want you to focus on everything that's out of your control. He wants you to focus on what's in your control, which is you. And you may have been through some hard circumstances, but let me tell you, with Jesus, you can rise above any circumstances. If I only had a man... If I only had a woman, I hear a lot of people that's like, you know, I would be following God, but gosh, I just, being single is so hard. You know the problem? Someone like that ends up getting married, and then they go, God, do you see my spouse? They are so annoying. If I only wasn't married to them, I'd be following you more wholeheartedly. Jules has never said that to me, by the way. She's probably thought it. I know for me, I did this with my kids. When Julia and I were newly married, I would get up every day at 6 a.m., I'd read my Bible, I'd pray, I was really pressing into the things of God, and then we had our first child. And my alarm clock went from the alarm on my phone to my screaming one-month-old at 2, 3, 4, 5 in the morning. And I got out of my rhythm. And I found myself saying things to Juliet like, I'm just not spending enough time with God, and it's really because, I mean, we have a kid now, I, I, I can't do that. And I put the responsibility out there instead of dealing with it in here. And let me tell you, there are different seasons for everything. Your life will adapt and change from season to season. I'm not saying that's not going to happen. But I can't blame my (laughs) one-month-old daughter for why I'm not spending time with God. It seemed right at the time. Looking back on it now, it's pretty immature and ridiculous. (laughs) So I wonder, what is your Rome? What is that external thing that's keeping you distracted? Jesus says this in Matthew. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that is in your own? You know that before Jesus wants to deal with the sin around you, he wants to deal with the sin in you. Before Jesus does anything out there, it starts in here. Jesus was the king they needed, but he was not the king they wanted. We need to stop letting our Rome distract us and keep us preoccupied and keep us from living out the mission of God. It says in Luke, uh, describes the uh, triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, it says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, it says he wept over it. It's one of two times in scripture that Jesus weeps. If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but is now hidden from your eyes, they weren't ready to receive it. They had it, and they weren't ready. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is prophesying about 30 years later when the Israelites took matters into their own hands. Jesus didn't revolt against the Romans, so they did it on their own. And they were completely, utterly quashed in their rebellion. The entire city of Jerusalem was taken back over, and the temple was knocked down to nothing and completely destroyed as a punishment to Israel. When Jesus didn't give them what they want, they took matters into their own hands. It's a very, very dangerous thing to do. And it says because of this, they did not recognize the time of God's coming. They did not understand who Jesus was. The last question I want to ask you is, who do you believe Jesus to be? And the worship team can come and join. 
the very first time God describes and gives a name for himself is in the book of Exodus. Uh, Moses is walking along, a, a bush lights on fire, and he goes, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to go check that out. He walks over, and this burning bush starts speaking to him and says, hey, I actually want to use you to go set the Israelites free from being oppressed in Egypt. And uh, Moses goes to him and says, hey, uh, that's cool and all, but when I go back to the Israelites, who do I tell them said this to me and is sending me to go do this? I, I don't know who you are. Who, who do I tell them sent me? And God literally says, tell them Yahweh has sent you. We would say Y-A-H-W-E-H. In the Hebrew language, there's no vowels, so it's Y-H-W-H. Um, but Yahweh, anybody know what it literally means? I am. It means I am who I am. And so Moses goes, who should I tell him sent me? And he goes, tell him I am who I am sent you. I mean, could you imagine Moses walking back to the Israelites? Hey, guys, this burning bush lit on fire and was speaking to me and said we're going to be set free. Great, who was it? I am who I am. Who the heck is that? <laughs> like, I mean, the Bible's a little bit funny sometimes. But it literally means I am who I am. And in Scripture, Jesus says this line. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And it says that this, they picked up rocks to kill him. Not because he was a wise teacher, but because he was claiming to be God. In the beginning, you and I were created in God's image. And we need to be very careful that we're not trying to recreate him in our image. I wonder, are you following the real Jesus? we got a couple uh, different illustrations on the screen, I think. And by the way, I just want to say before we put these up, I'm not trying to make light of Jesus in any way. But what I am trying to make light of is what we project onto him that's not really him. So the first one is USA Jesus. I think when a lot of people think of Jesus, they might think of this. God's number one thing is trying to bless America. And don't get me wrong, I love America. I love being here. I love the country that we're a part of. It's, it's an amazing place to be. It's not perfect, but it's amazing. And the problem is Jesus' number one goal is not just to bless America. It's much bigger than that. There's uh, also hippie Jesus. The Jesus that never addresses sin. Never calls for repentance. He's all about the peace and love. Hippie, pot-smoking Jesus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with the electric guitar. <laughs> Vintage from the 70s. There's also wise teacher Jesus. And this is uh, people who may, maybe didn't grow up in church and they're like, well, you know, Jesus isn't God, but he's, you know, he's a good moral teacher. Jesus, Buddha, Confucius, I mean, they all have good things to say. It's what a lot of people believe when they think about Jesus. I've heard people say things about Jesus like, well, Jesus never got angry. Really? I've been called a lot of things in my life, but no one has ever turned at me and said, get behind me, Satan. I have never been called Satan in my life. I hope I never am. <laughs> But he turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. When Jesus goes into the temple and chases out the money changers, Luke tells us that he fashioned a whip and he chased them out of the temple. Hippie, pot smoking Jesus, peace and love. Jesus got angry. He didn't sin in his anger, but he did become angry. I hear people say things like, well, Jesus never walked away from anybody. Really? 41 times in the Gospels, Jesus walks away from someone, or he lets them walk away. The rich young ruler, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He had an Israel. His wealth was number one in his life. Jesus was distant second. And Jesus said, that's not right, you got to flip it. And he said, I won't do that. His fell, he, he, he walked away. Jesus doesn't chase him down. He doesn't say, hey, actually, I didn't really mean it. Come on back. He lets him go. If you want to walk away from Jesus, he will let you. He doesn't want you to, but he will let you. He turns to his disciples and he says, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it is when someone gets in Israel and puts it ahead of me. Anything that gets in the way of Jesus has got to go. Has to come back into alignment. 
if God is first in your life, everything else is going to come into proper order. If God is not first in your life, nothing else in your life is going to come into order. Do you worship Jesus for who he is or who you wish he was? It's a question that we have to ask ourselves. There's an old preacherism that if Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Jesus is either Lord of everything or he is Lord of nothing in our life. Who do you believe Jesus to be? Is he God? And are our actions lining up with this? Who you believe Jesus to be will determine whether you are prepared to meet Jesus when he comes back again. How prepared you are. Is there anybody in the room that believes that Jesus is coming back? You know the reason Palm Sunday is so significant? The reason Palm Sunday is so significant is that it didn't just happen, it is also going to happen. The book of Revelation says it this way, it speaks about when Jesus is returning. It says, after this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, not just Israel. From every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches. Palm Sunday didn't just happen, it's going to happen. They were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. Two thousand years ago, the Israelites were not ready and prepared to receive God as He is. They missed it. They missed Him. I wonder, are you and I ready today? Two thousand years ago, they missed it. They weren't ready. Are you ready? Am I ready? It's what we need to be asking ourselves. And in order to be ready, we must have Jesus in the highest authority in our life. And we fit everything else around that. We're not trying to fit him into a box that fits our existing worldview. That's not how it works. God is God. We also need to submit to Jesus' kingdom and not trying to get him to submit to our kingdom by just trying to get him to be our little genie in a bottle God. Get rid of all of my problems for me. If you get rid of all my problems, I'll worship you. It doesn't start out there, it starts in here. And we need to worship the real, authentic, risen Lord Jesus of the Holy Bible exactly as he is, not as we would maybe project him to be. Are you ready? Are you ready? Jesus says in Matthew, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour you do not expect him. Palm Sunday is coming. It's coming in an hour you don't expect. Are you and I going to be ready? Are we going to be ready to receive Jesus as he is? Or are we going to miss it? There's a couple of different groups of people that I want to pray for. One is, if you're here and maybe at some point in the message, it, it spoke to you about Israel. And maybe it could be your culture, your family, your political party, your whatever kind of worldview you have. But if you're honest with yourself, you have a tendency sometimes to kind of fit Jesus into that, to box him in. And today you're like, I, 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 need, to, I, need, to ru- flick, I need to flip that around. I need to put Jesus first in my life and fit everything else into that. If that's you, I'd love to pray for you. Um, If you're here today and you constantly find yourself obsessed with Rome, I would be following Jesus, but there's this thing out there that's stopping me. There's this thing out there. There's this thing out there. And today you're saying, hey, I don't want to start with the thing out there. I want to start with what's in here. I'd love to pray for you as well. Or maybe if you're here today and you're like, I I feel like I'm just missing out on on Jesus. I want to understand not who I project him to be, but who he actually is. I want to be ready and I want to be prepared for Palm Sunday. So if any of those three spoke to you with every head bowed and every eye closed, just to give people a sense of privacy in this place, if you'd like me to pray for you in one of those three areas, just give me a wave right now. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Hands going up all across the room. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Jesus, we thank you that you are Lord, you are King, you are Savior, you are God. 
And God, wherever we have put anything ahead of you in our life, God, we repent right now. We say, God, that's, that's out of order. We want to return it back to the way that it was intended to be. We put you first in every area of our life, and everything else needs to come into alignment with that. God, where there are those in here who have constantly been distracted by somebody else or something else or something that they've come from, God, and they've been projecting the challenges of their life on something they can't control. God, I thank you, God, that while we can't control what happened to us, we can control how we respond to it. And so, God, we ask that you would help us to respond in a way where, God, we say, search our hearts, know us. God, do any work that you need to do in us that brings us into alignment with who you are. And God, for those of us who are here today that say, God, we lay down every preconceived idea of who we might project you to be. We want to worship you as you are, in your fullness. God, we don't want to box you into some little category. We want the full God. We don't want to limit you. God, I pray for every single person here today that's wrestling with one of those three or more areas. God, we pray the Holy Spirit that you would speak to them right now. Give them specific steps to take, specific actions, God. Specific things that they can do. God, would you minister to them right where they're at? And God, we pray that this week, God, that they would notice a tangible difference, God. That there would be a, a right sizing, God, a, a right relationship with you. A freshness, an encounter with you, Holy Spirit, that they've been missing out on for a while. And God, that you would relieve the weight of the world that they've been carrying. God, that you would help them to realize, God, that you carried it for them. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. In Matthew, Jesus looks at one of his disciples and he asks, what do people say about me? And he gives him an answer. And then he looks and he says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? You know, every single one of us is going to have to answer that question. Who do you say Jesus is? Is he a peace-loving, hippie, pot-smoking Jesus? Is he a wise teacher Jesus that just had some good things to say? Or is he God? Is he, I am. And if you're here today and you've never made that decision to put your faith in Jesus, to say, Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe that you are Lord. I want to submit my life to you. I don't just want to be a part of an earthly kingdom. I want to be a part of your heavenly kingdom. Today, I'd love to offer you that opportunity to make that decision. Or if at one point in your life you were walking with God, you made that decision. But if you're honest with yourself, you've kind of veered off track. And today is your day to come back to him. To say, God, I, I kind of put some other things ahead of you, but today I'm coming back to you. And I want to make that fresh commitment, that fresh declaration of faith in you. This is your moment. So one more time, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, you want a relationship with Jesus. Or at one point in your life, you were walking with him wholeheartedly and you veered off track. And today you want to come back to him. You want to make that fresh decision, that fresh declaration, this is your moment. So on the count of three, if that's you, give me a wave. And no one else is looking around. This is a private moment between you and God. The only reason I'm asking you to lift a hand is so I know who I'm praying for. So if that's you on the count of three, give me a wave. One, Jesus loves you. He died and rose again so you could have life. Two, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't miss this moment. Three, give me a wave if that's you. Amazing. Thank you. I'll see you in the front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you in the sides. Thank you. See you in the back. Praise God. Anybody else want to make a decision to follow Jesus? Say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord. I believe you are who you say you are. Anybody else? Praise God. You can go ahead and look up here. The Bible says in the book of Romans that if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We will be in a right relationship with God. And by you putting your hand up and praying that prayer, that's you believing in your heart. And now I want to help give you some words to confess that and speak it out loud with your mouth. So if you put your hand up, you prayed that prayer, I'm going to lead you in our prayer. Repeat this back after me. And we're all going to say this along with you because we're in this together. So repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I need you. I've messed up, and I need your forgiveness. And today I choose to follow you. It's by your grace that I am saved, and by your power that I'm set free. It is a new day. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.